There are a few golden eras of auto racing, and the early 60s are among them. Three years of pure innovation, adding horsepower and speed, improving aerodynamics and tire composition, tweaking fuel formulas and engine design, hardly any rules or regulations to get in your way. And now imagine watching as that very same innovation crashes and burns, not just in the flames, into a giant fireball, an impenetrable screen of flames and black smoke. A crash so big it killed two people, halting a one million person event and almost killed the sport of racing dead in its tracks. That's what happened at the Indianapolis 500 in 1964. This particular year, the Indy 500 was riding high. The race hadn't had a casualty for five years, and there was an estimated crowd of over one million fans. And in the post-war era, motorsport was more popular than ever. But on May 30th, 1964, everything changed in one of the worst crashes in Indy history. A crash so bad it stopped the race, something that had never happened before. Today on Pass Gas, 1964 Indy 500. What made it one of the most awful days in racing history? Who was to blame for the two casualties? And ultimately, what did the tragedy lead to in terms of the Indy 500 and racing in general? We're giving you the whole story of the year they red flagged the Indy 500. So light up your cigarette, and don't buckle your seatbelt, because your car doesn't have one. It's 1964, and we're hitting the most famous oval in the world. Fast Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, longtime partners of the show. You know what I'm talking about. It is Valvoline, the original motor oil. Not only is Valvoline the first patented motor oil brand, they've also had many firsts in the industry. Valvoline had the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, the first racing oil. Those are all pretty good firsts. I don't know, I'm not in the oil business, but the first high mileage, first synthetic blend, and first racing oil, that sounds like pretty important firsts, okay? Guess what, they've never stopped innovating. Valvoline is constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today, including mine. That's right, I've got Valvoline in my car. It's got over 160,000 miles on it, still, still running strong because of Valvoline. Every motor oil Valvoline makes has been recently re reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Guys, I say this every week, they didn't have to do 40%, they could have done 5%, 10%, that would have been impressive still. 40% in your face! Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown, heat, friction, wear, and deposits. So sick of those deposits. Another reason we love Valvoline here at Pass Gas, they've been synonymous with some of the greatest racers ever. Talking Mark Martin, Hale Yarbrough, AJ Foyt, and our new NASCAR Cup champion, Mr. Chase Elliott in that number nine. Woo! You know what I'm talking about. So do yourself a favor, make sure you choose Valvoline for your car today. Head on over to valvoline.com slash original. Find the right oil for your engine today. Thank you very much, Valvoline. Love you. We all shop online, right? We've all seen that promo code field that taunts us at checkout. What are your secrets? What are you hiding? I don't know the codes. Well, thanks to our sponsor this week, Honey, now you can, because manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. They range from sites that have tech and gaming stuff to, you know, your favorite fashion brands or even food delivery. Uh, it's actually pretty amazing. Here's how it works, guys. Imagine you're shopping on your favorite sites and we go to check out the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupons. You just wait a few seconds as Honey searches for the coupons it can find on that site. If Honey finds a coupon that works, you get to watch those prices drop, baby. It's awesome. Honey has saved me a bunch of money just like two days ago. I was on a, a site for gaskets for my Chrysler. I bought an entire gasket set for my car, right? And guess what? Honey worked. I saved like 30 bucks, which <laughs> was pretty awesome. The original price was gonna be like 210 bucks. I only had to pay 180 bucks. I've got the Honey extension installed on all my browsers. So whenever I'm shopping online, it's right there. And it, it seems to always find money. Honey has found it's over 17 million members, over two billion dollars in savings it's incredible guys so if you don't already have honey you could be straight up missing out on free savings it's literally free it installs in a few seconds and by getting it you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast i never recommend things i don't use on this show get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash gas that's joinhoney.com slash gas thank you honey 
Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. You're the hiring expert for your company, and what you really need is help making your short list of quality candidates. You need a hiring partner who helps make your life a lot easier. You need Indeed. Indeed is the job site that makes hiring as easy as one, two, three. Post, screen, and interview all on Indeed. Get your quality shortlist of candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description faster, only pay for the candidates that meet must-have qualifications, and schedule and complete video interviews in your Indeed dashboard, all in one place. Indeed makes connecting with and hiring the right talent fast and easy. As someone who hires for Donut, I love how easy it is to search for candidates on Indeed. It just makes things a lot easier. With tools like Indeed Instant Match, giving you quality candidates whose resume on Indeed fits your job description immediately, and Indeed skill tests that on average reduce hiring time by 27%. As someone who is very busy all the time and also hiring people, 27% is a lot of time saved. You can choose from more than 130 skill tests to add to your own, then add your must-have requirements so you only pay for applications that meet them. According to Talent Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Get started right now with a free $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash past gas. That's one word, P-A-S-T-G-A-S. Get $75 credit at indeed.com slash past gas. Indeed.com slash past gas. Offer valid through June 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you, Indeed. <laughs> The UFOs of the ground are called race cars. Yes, they are. <laughs> Very good. Good segue. This is Pass Gas. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my two other hosts, James uh, Hoppus Pumphrey over here. Don't leave me all alone. And uh, Joe Kardashian Weber. No, Barker. Barker. <laughs> yeah. I was and then, going uh, between bits. Nolan DeLong Sykes. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, do you know, have you ever heard the explanation of why UFOs look weird in our atmosphere? Why they can just go in straight lines and then like switch? No, but I will pay you $50 to explain it to me right now. Okay. So have you ever heard of like the fourth dimension hypercube uh, theory? Okay. I think we missed like five steps. Uh, so, okay. Third dimension <laughs> is X, Y, Z axis, right? Right. Okay. So if you add a fourth dimension, our brains are not capable of comprehending it when fourth dimension objects move in three dimensional worlds they look like they're going in weird lines because they're hmm. they're going in between dimensions so that's one of the theories of why spaceships look like they can just like go one way and then stop right away oh and then go yeah, the other way. I yeah that's that. like a, a thing where it's like yeah and then all of a sudden it just was like yeah i'll show you the video because like it explains it a lot better it's cool I've always Makes understood, sense. though, that the I've always understood this always that uh, the fourth <laughs> dimension was is, a baby. Is, yeah. <laughs> since I was a baby, I always knew that the fourth dimension was time, though. How does how does that factor well, into it? It's I mean, it's like uh, the Tesseract is the fourth dimension, which is the hypercube. And right. that's like a cube inside of a cube. Um, and it just trying to explain it is like breaking my brain right now so gonna have know. to hit that cbd pen before i dive into this it sounds like <laughs> anyway this is a car podcast not a kardashian extraterrestrial podcast as much as i would like to do one of those that'd be sick hey why yeah. haven't the kardashians done anything with cars yet well joe there's that famous episode of uh keeping up with the kardashians where uh kim gets her first bentley if you haven't seen that one and then it just it just becomes a whole thing a whole yeah, it's her do. first Bentley, and then she goes to Del Taco, and then she cries because she totally shits <laughs> her pants. <laughs> that classic episode. Yeah, that classic episode. Chris Jenner and Brody Jenner both like shit <laughs> their pants too in the back, and they just fucking all <laughs> shit their pants. It's terrible. <laughs> cool. The sixties. Yeah, the sixties was a new era in motorsport. Many of the people interested in racing were World War II vets craving an adrenaline rush. Most of these drivers had day jobs and raced on nights and weekends. As more and more people became interested in cars and racing, smaller racetracks, known as bull rings, typically less than half a mile long dirt tracks, started popping up all over the country. Uh, there's a few in Slow County, where I'm from. 
Santa, Mar- yeah, Santa Maria Speedway. There was one, actually, in Atascadero. There was a short dirt oval. Uh, it got paved over, though. Uh, anyway, this provided a space for all these new hobbyists to try their hand at racing. And the goal for most everyone became the Indy 500, the one oval to rule them all. Even in the 60s, making it to the Indy 500 was a tall order. In the years before, drivers trying to make it to the big race would travel the country looking for a feature race. A track owner would offer a couple hundred bucks to the winner, and this prize would attract better drivers and big crowds. These young drivers would stay in motel rooms, sometimes four or five guys per room, work as their own mechanics, and live off the occasional $100 grand prize. They were all just trying to earn some money and impress a team owner so they could get to Indy. I mean, this is pretty common in the day. I knew a guy named uh, Mike Savelli, who was a big-time sprint guy back in the day. And, I mean, to this day, no, not sprint car. Uh, you know, um, this guy, Mike Savelli, he's a big-time, like, drag racer, kind of different. But, like, this was a super common lifestyle back then. You're just, like, a traveling, like like a bard, in a way, of a bard of racing, going from I mean, city to city yeah. all over the country, never really having a home, you know, staying with with any team owner house you could like, you know, it's just like, it's really like being in an independent band and like touring. We've covered a number of guys that are like this, like Smokey Eunuch had a similar story. Yeah. You don't have a lot of factory backing or like big sponsorship money. So you're just kind of, yeah. I mean, back then, man, you were just really doing racing for the love of it. There was besides like getting your grand prize. That that, it's not like that was going to your savings account for your retirement. Like that was just so you could have gas money. You get beer and gas for your next race. You know, yeah, that, was, like, that was kind of it. Please tip the traveling band. Please tip the <laughs> yeah. traveling racer. Yeah. Like, just literally staying at people's houses because all you had was your truck and your trailer, you know? And you don't even need food. Beer has enough calories to sustain you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, not only was the lifestyle of racing more rough and tumble, the sport as a whole was more dangerous with a lot fewer rules and regulations. By the 1950s, there was a concerning trend that was right there for anyone to notice. The technology and the speeds of the cars was outpacing the matching rules and safety practices. The sport was getting so dangerous that in 1955, Formula One world champion Alberto Ascari, who we mentioned in our very first uh, Ferrari episode, Vukovic actually died while racing at Indy in 1955 when his car somersaulted through the air and burst into flames. Two weeks later, at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, a racer crashed into the grandstands, killing the driver, and three onlookers. Finally, when two more indie drivers died later that year, there was a backlash. Wasn't there also that like uh, Formula One crash at Le Mans? Or it wasn't Formula One. It was, it was, it was a Le Mans crash. I believe it killed like 55 people. Yeah, 80 people um, were injured. Something like that, yeah. Because uh, Mercedes, I think a Mercedes and a Jaguar got into it. Yeah, someone was coming like, out of the pits and like took a cut across the track for some reason. It was a whole mess, yeah. Uh, we, we also mentioned that in our uh, Ferrari series at the, from the very beginning of the show. Anyway, the death rate got so bad that the American Automobile Association, which had been supporting auto racing since 1904, said that they would no longer sanction motorsport. This led to General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and American Motors, all AAA members, this is different than the auto club, uh, to pull their support from auto racing. Countries such as France, Germany, Spain, and Switzerland banned racing altogether until new safety measures and rules could be put into place. Mercedes and Jaguar both withdrew from the sport. All of this had almost no effect on the popularity of motorsport. Fans kept coming to races, and drivers kept racing, not despite of the danger, but because of it. And the car companies eventually gave up on trying to pull their support. By 1964, there were dozens of rising stars, all of them had started at those bull ring races already to prove their worth. So why was 1964 a boiling point for Indy? Well, there were a few different factors. A big change in 1964 was the design of the Indy cars. The technology was improving rapidly. The old Roadster design was out and the new mid-engine car was in. What is surprising was how quickly it all changed. Between 1953 and 1963, there hadn't been much change to the design or engineering of the cars racing in Indy. In fact, during that entire decade, of the 330 cars that qualified for Indy, only 21 were powered by something other than the traditional Offenhauser or Offy engine. I follow Offenhauser on Instagram. Oh, they're still around? It's 
Great account. Yeah. Really cool. fun. Yeah. I mean, Offenhauser, they were also super big. Uh, you could think of them as like the American, like Cosworth in a way. Oh, mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, of those 21 cars that weren't traditional Offenhauser engines, eight were supercharged versions <laughs> of the traditional Offenhauser engine. Ten were supercharged Novi engines. Two were supercharged Cummings diesels. And one was a Ferrari. That's crazy that a couple diesel engines were in there. Yeah, right? What's strange to look back on is that this loyalty to the Offie was not because of the rules of Indy. In fact, the rules and regulations of the sport were very lax. There was no weight limit, no horsepower limit, no rules on the type or amount of fuel a car could carry, but there had been very little development or advancement of the cars at Indy since it restarted after World War II. A big part of this may have been the lack of materials and resources after the end of the devastating war. But by the end of the 50s, a things was starting to change. <laughs> Cue uh, that Credence song. Burning. It ain't me. Yeah. Burning. <laughs> 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 helicopter noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by the early 60s, mid-engine designs were gaining in popularity. Most of this innovation came from Europe. It all started with the Englishman John Cooper. Cooper started building small mid-engine machines in the late 1940s, and in 1957, he started bringing them to F1 races. The Australian driver Jack Brabham was the first to drive a mid-engine Cooper-built machine in the F1 post-war era. F1 post-war era sounds like a like sick, like... Midwest just, emo band. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking, like, just a bass player and a drummer. <laughs> and, like, yeah. like, like kind of like... Uh, like new soul <laughs> like kind of like, like death black from keys, above kind of like yeah like death from above 1979. yeah yeah uh we're called f1 post-war era we're the post-war <laughs> kids <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it turned out to be a great decision on bradman's part he went on to win five consecutive gp races in 1960 driving cooper's mid-engine car after the season ended brabham who was friends with Indy driver Roger Ward, arranged a practice run at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. After the practice run, Ward agreed to let Brabham race his mid-engine Cooper car in the 1961 Indy 500. That's like Lewis Hamilton going to like Indy and being like, yeah, mate, why don't you, okay, cool. Why don't you just take a couple laps on her? Oh, you like it? Yeah, go ahead and race it in Indy 500. Wait, why is Lewis Hamilton Australian? <laughs> he's not. <laughs> he's not. He's just. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That sounds yeah. pretty good. That, my... Oh, yeah. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, mate. Why don't you take my car? You sound like Taika Waititi. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Lewis Hamilton sounds like. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He sound... Yeah, he does. <laughs> nah, nah. He sounds... no, he's like cool. He's like very laid back, like very nice. Oh, yeah. He's like. I think he talks. <laughs> he does have like a high pitched voice, though. You got a little bit of nasal. Yeah, it's a little nasal. It's like, hey, oh, cool. So, <laughs> you like the car? <laughs> you know, we're gonna get a million comments that are like, oh, James, <laughs> James just does reads these scripts so he can do an English accent. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that well, yeah. Why do you think we do a podcast? Uh, but I earn it. Yeah, hey, mate. Or, or I'm Lewis King Hamilton, and I brought my Mercedes here to Indianapolis, Indiana. Why don't you take a couple laps around this here course? Yeah, that's Lewis oh, Rick Top Hamilton. You like it? Well, why don't you drive it in the next NASCAR race, my little piggy? Everything he's saying is really nice, but he says it really aggressively. Mm hmm. The mid-engine Cooper design wasn't a perfect Cinderella story. Brabham placed ninth and ultimately decided not to come back to the Indy in 1962. But the changes had been set in motion, and the mid-engine car was there to stay. With Cooper and Brabham heading back to F1 in Europe, it left then-newcomer Mickey Thompson. Nice. Ooh, we know him. I know. To take up the mantle of the mid-engine car. By the time entries for the 64 Indy 500 closed, 
nearly half of the cars were mid-engine. MT. Again, this is so like weird. Like, it's a guy brought his F1 car over from <laughs> Europe, and remember, there's no internet now, so everyone's just like, "Oh, that looks pretty cool." <laughs> like, "Oh, you put it in the back." Oh yeah, Dang, that makes dude, sense. That, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So you yeah, don't we'll get just... like all smoky face and stuff. <laughs> no, dude, there's no flames on your face or nothing. And then that is just like, well. All right, mate, we got to go back to England. You're going to do <laughs> F1. Uh, Mickey, you want to keep this F1 car? <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. There are a couple other factors beyond car design in the danger of the Indy 500. Tires and fuel, for one. For years, what everyone used at the Indy 500 was a fuel combo of alcohol, methanol, or ethyl combined with nitromethane because it added performance. So basically, the cars were running on a methane alcohol fuel blend, uh, you know, and Alco- I- alcohol and meth sounds like my twenties. <laughs> <laughs> Joe knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, we did a lot of pop back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's start a business. <laughs> Let's go to now, Vanguard. <laughs> people were starting to experiment with gasoline, which had better fuel economy. This caused some tension, and there was some debate over which was better. Lewis Meyer, the co-owner of Offenhauser, whose engines were designed to run on racing fuel and not gasoline, said that gasoline was too dangerous to use in a high-speed oval race like the Indy 500. But many other people pointed out that the race fuel was just as dangerous because alcohol fires were hard to see and almost invisible when they happened. Yeah, there's those like old race films of the guys just like, ah, and you don't know what's going on because you can't see anything. Yeah, you're like, are you on fire or do yeah. you have ants? <laughs> because like ants were also a huge problem back then but like nolan like you used to race uh like junior dragsters and you guys used methanol yeah and we did weren't and you saying that like that's like just a huge fear as a child to yeah like that was burn. like one of the first things my dad told me was like now look son this thing runs on <laughs> methanol so uh if methanol you can't see the flames so i'm like 10 years old like i'm sorry what yeah. Uh, so what am I supposed to do? <laughs> how am I sp- how am I supposed to 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 face that? It's uh, like yeah, it's like you know, it's pretty much like baseball, except there's invisible flames. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah, we're gonna stra- you're gonna put on you're gonna have to put on a helmet, some fire resistant <laughs> clothing. You're gonna be strapped yeah. in with seat belts that you've never seen before as a child. Oh yeah, and the fire is invisible. <laughs> the fire is invisible. You're gonna rock it to 200 miles per hour. <laughs> no, I was like, at that, at 10 years old, you're going like 50. But uh, yeah, but also like to go 50, it's like, well, why don't we just use not a lawnmower engine, and then we don't have to use invisible flame fuel. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Anyway, uh, let's. See. The debate of race fuel versus gasoline basically came down to horsepower versus economy. Race fuel gave you tons of power. But gas gave you a lot of laps, a lot of efficiency, and many teams were trying to run the race with only two pit stops. In fact, the Ford team said they might be able to run the whole 500 with no pit stop. That's outrageous. But it also meant that they had to carry between 80 and 90 gallons of gas. Oh, my God. That's just like a rolling bomb. Yeah, to put that into perspective, like the average gas tank is probably 15 to 16 gallons, right? Yeah. My Impreza is like 10. 90 gallons. Yeah, wild. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, that's like two, that's like three pickup trucks. <laughs> There's like a Mini Cooper waiting for you to move. <laughs> You're just like filling your gas tank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, it'll be a few more minutes. <laughs> Big tank, sorry. <laughs> uh, I forgot my Slim Jims. I got to run in real quick. <laughs> Well, into this debate stepped our man, Mickey Thompson. He was known as the king of pop for the field blends that he created. King of before, pop. Before Elvis, mind you. King of pop is Michael Jackson. Yes, Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Elvis, yes. <laughs> but Thompson was also starting to work on his mid-engine cars, which offered less space for fuel storage. So what did Thompson do? Well, he started hanging a large, hard rubber bladder on the inside of the rails of his cars. So, like, he had fuel bladder reservoirs. Exoskeleton? 
Well, this was like in, in the frame rails of the car. Oh, okay. So like lower center center of gravity, all that weight was just... He didn't have a huge gas tank, so he just filled the whole car with gas. <laughs> <laughs> Like what are the, like what how does that affect handling like just having a ton of liquid? Well, you're slower but you have more uh weight on the tires so you have more grip and at the end of your run with less less weight in the car, you know, you're probably going to have a harder time putting the power down because now your tires have less grip both mechanically and with weight less weight on them. So But the car also gets- especially especially on a oval track like aren't you being pulled to the outside? Yeah. Of the track. Like, I mean, you can feel this in, when you do like eye racing, for example. Like, you, like, this is still factored in, you know. The beginning of your run, you're fat and slow, but you have reliable grip. And by the end of your run, you're, you're sliding, and, uh, but you're light, you know. Yeah. Look, I've played eye racing. I know exactly what these guys have gone through. A big thanks to Sunday Long Care for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Can I ask you guys a question? What's stopping you from taking care of your lawn? For me, it's a bunch of problems. It's too many problems for me to mention. There's pests, there's dry spots, there's weeds, there's all these things that all make it so hard for me to just go outside and take care of my lawn. But the good thing about Sunday Lawn Care is they make it so easy, you can't not take care of your lawn. Sunday's more than just a lawn care product. It's a custom lawn care plan with a variety of ways to help you grow a beautiful lawn, control weeds, and remove pests. Those are all my problems, actually. They take out all the guesswork and unwanted chemicals from the equation so you can grow a beautiful lawn that's better for you, better for pets, better for the planet. What I like most about Sunday is that I didn't have to do anything for them to send me stuff. You put in your address, using satellite images, they figure out exactly the the square footage of your lawn, the chemical composition of your soil, and the climate, which is all stuff I didn't know. It's not just the free lawn analysis, it's really cool. They send you a package quarterly with everything you need to take care of your lawn. All you have to do is input your address and they figure out everything for you. There's also add-ons like weed control, seeds, or pest control that are all super easy to use too. I just went to GetSunday.com and put my home address in like I was telling you. And with their free lawn analysis tool, they took care of the rest. That's all you have to do is literally just put your address in. It's really fun. And Sunday is made with ingredients that you can actually pronounce like seaweed, iron, and molasses instead of those like 25 syllable chemical names. You can actually know what you're putting on your lawn and feel safer about it. And all I had to do was attach the ready to use pouch to my garden hose and spray. And that was it. Best of all, this stuff really works. All I had to do was spray it and my lawn already looks way better than it did before. So let Sunday take the guesswork out of growing a greener, more beautiful lawn this spring. Visit GetSunday.com slash past to get $20 off your custom lawn plan at checkout. That's $20 off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash past. P-A-S-T. Thank you, Sunday. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, BetterHelp. What interferes with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? You know, this past, uh, past year has obviously been very challenging for everyone, myself included. That definitely kept me from from doing my best, that's for sure. Well, that can change with help from our sponsor this week, BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. That's right, you can connect in a private and safe online environment, super convenient, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it is professional counseling done securely online. Awesome. Send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. Like I said, very convenient. All this without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room, looking around, being like, are people looking at me? What's this guy's deal? Is that a popular mechanics from 2014? BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That's part of the therapy process. You got to find a therapist that works for you. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. Service is available for clients worldwide, and BetterHelp makes it easy to find the particular expertise 
you need online. Don't limit yourself to the counselors located near you. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. They've got a wide spectrum of specialists. And don't worry, everything you share is confidential. It's convenient. It's professional. Best of all, BetterHelp is affordable. Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. And remember, BetterHelp was not a crisis line. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I love how easy, convenient, and affordable BetterHelp is, and I think you will too. So get on it, guys. I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash past gas. That's betterhelp.com slash past gas. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash past gas. Thank you very much, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this episode. Another debate taking place was with the tires used at the Indy 500. For years and years, everyone had used Firestone. Since the beginning, in fact. And there had been little development in tires. But in 1963, Firestone made Mickey Thompson specialty 12-inch tires for his mid-engine cars. And in 1964, Thompson's racers were specifically designed to run on 12-inch tires. But before 1964, the USAC mandated a 15-inch minimum tire height, making Thompson scramble to rework his cars just months before the race. And this eventually led Thompson to design his own tire. They're still around today. Yes, sir. So Thompson was being extremely innovative, but also reckless with safety. His cars now had quickly designed custom tires, fuel bladders hanging on the inside frame rails of the car, making his cars an accident waiting to happen. They were also full of porcupines, and they (laughs) had uh, broken broken mirrors on them and upside-down horseshoes. (laughs) Of course, if you listen to Past Gas regularly, you already know about Nikki Thompson. If not, go back and listen to our episode on Nikki Thompson. (laughs) Mickey was an Irish guy with a lot of bravado and a competitive streak. He loved tinkering with cars and was known by the nickname... (laughs) <laughs> the backyard mechanic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which seems a little underwhelming for someone of yeah. that stature. Yeah, like, that's almost an insult. It's like, no, guys, I'm not a backyard. Me- I'm like a, n- I'm a world renowned championship. And his nickname, racing. the hobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the the bathroom Madonna. <laughs> in in 1961, he went to his first indie. This is where he saw Brabham race the mid engine car. The next year, he came back with his own car in the race, an evolution of the car raced by Brabham and developed with former Cooper engineer John Crosswaite. <laughs> <laughs> it also featured a unique independent rear suspension and a V8 Buick engine. Thompson received 59 of 67 votes in winning the annual Mechanic Achievement Award, a huge accomplishment for a first timer, especially with the nickname, the backyard mechanic. It's like, guys, I won like in a landslide, the mechanical <laughs> it, achievement award. Yeah. People like, voted I competed with me. everybody. It's like, okay. Yeah. But you did it in your backyard. Didn't yeah. You? Right. It's, no, it's I did it in, in, a, in a clean room lab. <laughs> so suffice to say, Thompson had a knack for innovating cars for racing. After that, Mickey went back to Long Beach, California and started working on his all-new car for Indianapolis in 1963. That year, he had three new cars in the race, in addition to two of his cars from the year before. That's five. (laughs) But Thompson had difficulty keeping drivers employed because his cars were hard to handle. All that innovation meant Thompson sometimes took chances and cut corners, but he kept innovating. He was obsessed with aerodynamics and streamlining, which were new ideas in the 60s. He kept tinkering with his designs, and for the 1964 Indianapolis 500, he finally had drivers. His old friend Graham Hill and newcomer Dave McDonald test drove Thompson's new design in March before the 64 race. Hill found the new design diabolical (laughs) and would not return to Indy to drive Thompson's car. But McDonald was like, 
I like diabolical. Mm, I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 Mc, but McDonald was like, do 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 do. I'm loving it. You know what I really like about this car is the sloshing. Every time I take a turn, <laughs> it feels like the whole car just sloshes around on these tiny tires. <laughs> you know, you like you drive a lot of cars, and you're like, man, I wish this thing sloshed more. <laughs> But I like this car sloshes. It's like being in one of those joke mugs that has like liquid inside the rim of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those pens that you turn upside down and, <laughs> yeah. and the lady's clothes come off. But it's a car. And it's a death trap also. <laughs> <laughs> I like death and traps. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> I'm Dave McDonald. Dave McDonald. Is the love child of uh, Dave Wendy's and Ronald <laughs> yeah. McDonald. So Thompson had been tinkering with the mid-engine cars and the aerodynamics, but one of the only drivers willing to take a chance on Thompson's designs in the 64 Indy was Dave McDonald. What was it about Dave McDonald that made him such a confident driver? And how did Thompson find his first-time Indy driver from SoCal? Oh, uh, dude, they were in line at Wahoo's Fish Taco, and they both ordered the same tostada bowl. <laughs> Dave McDonald was a shy, timid guy from Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> he loved cars and racing, and by the late 50s, McDonald was a top local drag racer. Awesome. He drove a series of Corvettes and held almost every class and strip record in the Southwest. Damn, this guy's sick. Your, he didn't- un- your grandpa probably knew him, right? I mean, probably, yeah. I probably, I probably like two degrees removed from this guy. And if he cool. didn't win a race, oh weird. I'm, I'm looking at a picture of Dave McCon. He looks way more like Nolan than <laughs> Nolan's dad or grandpa. <laughs> Whoa, that's crazy. And he, and actually, his order at Wahoo's was the same thing that Nolan always <laughs> oh, orders wow. at Nolan, Wahoo's. Nolan, you, you always order this Baja Tostada. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, (laughs) anyway if he didn't win uh his wife sherry would oh that's cool a little couple action there that's awesome sometimes he would drive through the elimination round and then his wife sherry would drive in the finals dude that's that's sick dude dude i'm looking at a picture of sherry and she looks a lot more like (laughs) nolan than nolan's grandma (laughs) (laughs) anyway not only was McDonald a great driver, he was also a gifted mechanic, and he would do car repairs and tune-ups on the side to help pay for his racing. He especially loved Corvettes. One story claims that McDonald once listened to a customer's Corvette over the phone and successfully diagnosed <laughs> the issue. That's sick. That's this guy's cool. awesome. I love this guy. McDonald's success at the drag strip attracted the attention of Don Steve's Chevrolet, a dealership with a history of racing involvement. Steve, you don't really hear that anymore. There's not like many dealerships outside of like exotics that have race teams uh steves offered him a job as a driver and mechanic for the 1960 season and mcdonald accepted as soon as he started racing it was clear that the man had a gift in 1961 at riverside drag strip he set a new class record he went on to win nine straight road races to open the season this guy is just multifaceted a real a real swiss army knife behind the wheel all the success started to make McDonald a fan favorite on the West Coast. The, the best coast, dude. Uh, fans, <laughs> uh, fans loved his aggressive driving style, and since he had no real training, McDonald drove mostly on feel and intuition. He also loved oversteer, which appropriately earned him the nickname the Master of Oversteer. <laughs> <laughs> Not super... Uh... <laughs> Say, there goes the master of oversteer and his Ah, (laughs) mastery of oversteer. Look at the master of oversteer is talking with the backyard mechanic. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But to most fans, he went by another nickname, the natural. Oh, that's way better. That's way cooler. McDonald. Yeah. McDonald was super aggressive on the track. You know, sometimes he would start at the back and win just to give fans a show. Start from the back, baby. That's cool. This over the top. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> it's like no, no way <laughs> it's like i know i qualified uh p1 but uh i'm gonna go to the back just to give the people a show and he winks at the fans as he's like reversing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like if he is he needs to go do a harder sport 
This over-the-top driver persona didn't match his real life. As usually after winning a race, McDonald was a quiet guy who liked to sit in the corner of the party and listen to other people talk. You know what? I relate to this guy. Because yeah. he's your grandpa. He's your real grandpa. Oh, yeah, oh. he's like 100%. <laughs> cool. Well, anyway, in 1963, <laughs> Carol Shelby hired McDonald to drive for him. In his second race, driving a Cobra, McDonald won. And it didn't stop there. He won eight of his 12 races driving for Shelby. God, how have I never heard of this guy? After racing for Shelby, McDonald was approached by Mickey Thompson, who needed another drive for his cars he'd entered into the 64 Indianapolis 500. This was a huge deal for McDonald. As a self-taught young guy, master of <laughs> overster he was, this would be his first Indy after driving professionally for only a few years. He taught himself how to be a young guy. <laughs> yeah, he was a self-taught young man. Uh, before McDonald agreed, he asked the opinion of his crew chief, Pete, who had some foreboding words. Pete, spelled P-A-A-T, warned McDonald, quote, uh, think very seriously before driving that car. <laughs> he, he didn't think Thompson had put enough development into the car. McDonald also asked his current car owner, Shelby, for his opinion. Shelby also told McDonald not to do it. In a slightly more blunt quote, Shelby said, I beg Davey not to and fool with that pile of shit <clears throat> Mickey Thompson built. Nothing added up. Mickey was very smart. But there were too many innovations in it. I said, Davey, please don't drive that car. Please don't get in it. Let's just take a breath, go eat some chili, and have some fun. <laughs> and he was like, yo, I'm going to drive this car. I was like, okay, well, you want some chili? And he was like, okay. And so he ate some chili, but in the end, he ended up driving the car. We actually added an extra bladder inside the car just to hold chili. <laughs> chili bladder. That's bladder. actually that <laughs> chili bladder. That's how the um, the camel pack was invented. It was so that, uh, yeah. Shelby. I need some way to warm my shoulders and my back, but also eat chili. <laughs> yeah, so Shelby team drivers could eat chili while they raced. <laughs> keep giving energy. So after all that, after all the deliberation and the chili uh, camel back innovation. Uh, McDonald agreed to race for Mickey Thompson at the 1964 Indy 500. The 1964 Indianapolis 500 wasn't just a big deal for Thompson and McDonald. There was another driver ready to compete who had a lot on the line. Someone who had been driving at Indy for years. A guy named Eddie Sachs. Sachs couldn't have been more different than McDonald in both personality and driving style. I've had enough like health problems that I would not be like even like as a child i wouldn't have been able to survive in this era but i do wish i could go to the party yeah like race car parties in like the 60s so sick just like mickey thompson carol shelby like they would dude guys they would think we were so funny and it's uh, it's always <laughs> at a place like called the starting line in riverside <laughs> yeah the ch the checker stop in yeah. irvine <laughs> yeah. like we would be like we'd probably have like a radio show and like uh, a like vaudeville sort of like USO tour <laughs> and do like a Christmas special on CBS every year. Yeah. Like, ah, it's the guys from Donut Media. Hey, guys, Donut Media. And he's like, hey, hey, uh, Pumphrey, do your fucking, uh, do your one bit. Like we have to put out a video basically every day. But if we live back then, we'd have to make four jokes a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we were just they'd be like hey say that one joke from two years ago I was like, okay guys hey what's the difference between what's the difference between a car and a car without a roof ah <laughs> oh, classic eddie Sachs was an over-the-top charismatic guy a college dropout just like kanye west Sachs started racing cars at 19 but for all of this love of cars Sachs was not a very good driver he got his start with midget and sprint car circuits and oftentimes crashed before he even qualified for a race. Eddie was known as much for his personality as his driving. He was a rowdy, wisecracking womanizer who was reckless on and off the track. He was a fan favorite, but his attitude often pissed off fellow drivers. But Sachs loved racing and would do anything to stay in the game. This guy either rules or sucks. Yeah. No in between. <laughs> he sacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. During the offseason, he worked odd jobs. He was a bellhop in Miami, a cab driver in Los Angeles, and even ran a nightclub. Whatever his side jobs were, he kept coming back to racing. And by 1952, he won his first event. 
Throughout it all, Eddie's goal was always the Indy 500. He first tried out for Indy in 1953, but failed his rookie test. By 1956, he passed that test, but didn't qualify to drive in the race until 1957. Finally, by the 60s, Sachs had proven his worth and was becoming a sought-after driver. Al Dean, owner of Dan Van Lines. <laughs> what? Dan Van Lines. One of the elite indie teams was interested in Eddie, but Dean's chief mechanic didn't like Eddie, saying he was loud, almost boastful. His all-consuming interest was selling Eddie Sachs. But Dean hired Sachs anyway. <laughs> I don't like him, but... I have a lot of other choices, so I'm going to hire him anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Once he was on the team, Sachs was constantly running his mouth and got into fights with fellow drivers, Roger Ward, Jim Rathman, and Parnelli Jones. Parnelli he, Jones. Parnelli. You know, I'll name my kid Parnelli. Parnelli Pumphrey. No, Parnelli is a great name. <laughs> Parnelli Weber? No. <laughs> Par, Parnelli Sykes? I think so. I think that's the move. Yeah, that's a good. One. I'm gonna name my kid Jethro. No, Nolan, you should name your kid Soren. Soren oh, Sykes. No. No. <laughs> no. Oh, you should name your kid Bison. Bison Sykes. Bison? <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm not doing any of those like new agey LA kid yeah. names. Okay. Where are you gonna name your kid then? Space Captain. Uh, Humphrey James Sykes. <laughs> 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 uh. The year before, at Indianapolis in 1963, Sachs had lost control of his car and spun out. He partially blamed oil that had been spilled on the track, causing his tires to start sliding. At the victory luncheon after the race, Sachs spent the entire time heckling Parnelli Jones. Sachs was such a jerk during lunch and that Jones didn't even want to talk to him when Sachs came up to him at the bar uh, after the lunch. Jones said that Sachs was lying to reporters, saying that it was Jones who spilled oil that made Sachs lose the race. Sachs then called Jones a liar. Jones responded with, call me a liar again, and I will bust right in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, no. I think you said, miss the you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's an actual quote. <laughs> call, <laughs> call me a liar again, and I'll bust you right in the mouth <laughs> to this sax responded you're the liar <laughs> and, and as promised jones punched sax in the mouth and they wrestled on the ground uh until separated that is like fights are so embarrassing yeah it's just like you have this like idea that you're gonna like do like some like transporter type yeah or something <laughs> yeah. but then like it's like hey you want to like stretch out your shirt and get your face real red like maybe like skin your elbow yeah. it's like yeah 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 that's what i want to do do you want to both uh <laughs> both lo lose our dignity at the same time yeah. you, you want to like remind yourself that you don't exercise at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like two punches before you're winded yeah <laughs> it's like <sighs> it's it's pretty amazing that this interaction is so well documented like who is writing down oh jones says you're a liar and then sack says you're a liar <laughs> well it's not exactly like mind-bending dialogue so yeah but it's also like the 60s after the indianapolis 500 so like everyone's wearing like turtlenecks and sport coats and smoking cigarettes with like long extensions and drinking like there's mm -hmm. like journalists hunter all s around thompson's them. there yeah hunter s thompson's like and then uh Parnelope jones said uh to sacks that all you're the liar. And, and uh, <laughs> after the fight, Sax's wife, Nance, worked fast, taking some of her mascara to blacken his eye for photos. Damn, Nance, you a down ass. Uh, <laughs> then she put a miniature black flag in his mouth, telling reporters, quote, his mouth has been black flagged. <laughs> that was Eddie Sachs and his wife. <laughs> The fans loved him, calling him the clown prince of racing. Eddie was convinced 1964 was going to be his year. He even told Nance that as soon as he won the Indy 500, he's going to retire from racing. It wasn't worth the risk. Dude, Nance is tight. Yeah. Where did she find a little tiny black flag? She had it on her just in case, bro. <laughs> 
my guy's going to get in a fight and I'm going to use this. <laughs> he runs his mouth. I can't wait till he gets in a fight so I can tell him he's been black flagged. Another thank you to our sponsor this week. You guys heard me talking about him before. It's Valvoline Motor Oil. I can't believe I get to say that they're sponsoring one of our shows. I've had a deep appreciation for Valvoline ever since I was a little kid. I had a little Mega Blocks model of Mark Martin's number six Valvoline car back in the day. Great looking car. And this is some good looking oil. Let me tell you about it. Valvoline is the original motor oil. Not only were they the first patented motor oil, like I keep telling you guys, they've also had many firsts in the industry. Get your first high mileage oil, your first synthetic blend oil, your first racing oil. A lot of great firsts, if you ask me. Uh, and they never stop innovating, okay? Valvoline is constantly reinventing their formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil Valvoline makes has been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. 40%! A lot. 40%. Come on. It's almost 50%. Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown, fucking heat, friction, wear, and deposits. You just don't want those in your engine. Valvoline fights all of those. Another reason we love Valvoline here at Pass Gas is that they're synonymous with some of the best racers in the dang business. They sponsor a lot of great racers like Mark Martin, the aforementioned number six Taurus back in the 90s. Great looking car. You got Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and NASCAR Cup champ Chase Elliott, that number nine car. Seems like a cool dude. If you want to be a cool dude or do debt, do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline for your car today, just like I have. I trust it with my car and you should too. Head on over to valvoline.com slash original and find the right oil for your engine today. Thank you, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Indeed is the job site that makes hiring as easy as one, two, three. The first three numbers of the alphabet, actually. Post, screen, and interview all on Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. As someone who hires people at Donut, I think Indeed is an invaluable tool to use. It makes everything so much easier, and if you can just set your parameters, you can make things so much quicker and more efficient. And as someone who is very busy, I really appreciate Indeed. Some cool things about Indeed. As soon as you sponsor a post on Indeed, you get your quality shortlist from resumes on Indeed that match your job description. So it's not just a big smattering of applications. Choose Indeed and join 3 million companies worldwide who use Indeed to hire great people and help grow their teams faster. Indeed is the number one source of hires in the US, according to Talent Nest. Indeed delivers one and a half times more hires than even internal referrals, according to Talent Nest. With Indeed Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates as soon as they sponsor the job post. 73% of all online job seekers in the US visit Indeed each month according to Comscore. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent. Get started right now with a free $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash passgas. Offer valid through June 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you, Indeed, for sponsoring this episode. So we have the history, the innovations, and the drivers. We got all the background. But what actually happened on that day in 1964? How did the race go down? As always, the race started with... Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> As the green flag waved, the race got off to a clean start with Jimmy Clark, Parnelli Jones, and A.J. Foyt in front. In the third row was Lloyd Ruby, Len Sutton, and Don Branson. Behind in the fourth row was rookie Walt Hansgen and Jim Perturb... Her, 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 Those are fake names. Her Those are fake names. Her 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 and Jim Herderbees. <laughs> Drivers fighting for position were now running three and four wide as they approached the first turn. Two other rookies start up front, McDonald and Rooney Duman, who both moved to the bottom of the track. Sachs followed Her Turbies to the outside, moving in front of Johnny Rutherford. Sachs and Rutherford carried their momentum into the first turn, moving past Duman and McDonald. So Sachs and Rutherford are, are, they got speed, they got a good run coming out of the first turn, moving past Duman and McDonald. And cleaning into the inside of the track was one Bobby Unser. Drivers Marsham and Ward passed Jones on the back straight away, and by the second lap, Gurney was passed Jones and Foyt. Uh, McDonald passed Sachs and Rutherford uh, on the low side, 
between the first and second turns as they started lap number two. Rutherford said later that when he saw McDonald, he thought to himself, whoa, he's either going to win this thing or crash. McDonald was soaring. Maybe it was the combination of the slow start, crowded lines of cars in front of him, how well his Thompson car was handling with a full load of fuel, or maybe it was pure adrenaline. But McDonald was going big and driving aggressively as he was known to do. Like he's uh, leasing a car from Rusnick. Well, also, I mean, this, this car... Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that got, pretty that, funny. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that got me. That got no me. one thinks it's pretty funny, Joe. I think it's pretty <laughs> funny. Joe's one of my favorite comedians. Okay, I don't. You know, I don't have to. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Uh, McDonald was behind drivers Franson, Sutton, and Rothman. He passed all three of them before the fourth turn and moved into tenth place. So he's climbing up through the field. As Jim Clark approached the first turn. McDonald exited the fourth and was closing in fast on Hansgen, who in turn was closing fast on Herturbis. That's the weirdest name ever. It's very weird. Herturbis. Herturbis. <laughs> McDonald started edging his car to the left to pass Hansgen as they moved down the front straight, okay? So he's going to the inside. A split second later, Hansgen made the same move on Herturbis, forcing McDonald to veer left again, so he has to go even further inside. Then it happened. McDonald lost control of the red Thompson. His car turned a full 180 degrees and went sliding backwards towards the inside wall. He had the front wheels turned in full opposite lock and the brakes jammed in an attempt to slow his car down. At the last second, he turned and hit the wall. The rubber bladder holding the car's gasoline was on the left side of the car, and even though the impact was on the right side of the car, the force of the crash tore the neck off the bladder from the refueling cap, shooting a stream of gasoline across the car and onto the hot exhaust pipes. The gas ignited, immersing the car in flames. McDonald's car hit the inside wall and bounced off of it, sending him back into oncoming traffic, completely engulfed in flames. The strength of the impact threw his car to the left another 180 degrees, and the nose of the car was headed towards the outside wall this time. The right rear suspension was destroyed on the initial impact and dug into the track, pivoting McDonald's car yet again, the jerking movement spilling more gasoline onto the fire. McDonald was sliding back across the track, pulling a screen of orange flames and dense black smoke behind him. Behind McDonald were the three drivers he had just passed, Branson, Sutton, and Rothman. All three drivers didn't hesitate. They stayed in the natural high groove coming out of the fourth turn and running flat out, they made it past the sliding and burning car. That's they were terrifying. Yeah, that's insane. They were lucky enough to make it past, but not so lucky was Eddie Sachs. Coming onto the front stretch and closing fast was Sachs, followed at two car lengths by Rutherford and Duman, running nose to tail. Unser was another car length back. As they came up on the fourth turn, they all saw a cloud of dust, and then they saw McDonald's car explode. All four drivers could see his burning car sliding back across the track. The whole circuit now was blocked with fire. All four drivers knew they couldn't stop. They had to drive through the flames. Sachs tried to find a break in the fire to make it through. He veered left and turned directly into the left side of McDonald's car. The left side, coincidentally, oh, where no. the gasoline bladder was still intact. The collision punctured the Thompson side the collision punctured the Thompson's gas bladder and the front gas tank on Sachs' Shrike, touching off a second explosion of flames even greater than the first. Rutherford, Dumont, and Unser were right behind them. Sachs hit McDonald with such force that it lifted the rear of the Shrike completely off the ground. Rutherford, seeing this, jerked his steering wheel to the right in a desperate attempt to avoid Sachs and reached the narrow gap between McDonald and the wall, but he caught the right rear tire of Sack's car, forcing Rutherford under the rear wheels before launching up and over McDonald's sideways racer. Dude, this is just like a description of a nightmare. Yeah. Like, all of this is like, the whole time, McDonald is on fire. Like, this, this man is burning. All these dudes are coming up on this, like, huge fire, and then just like... <laughs> And like now they're part of like just yeah. I mean, this is why we have regulations in racing. Yeah. Rutherford thought he was a goner. Then he burst free of the conflagration, 
his car on fire but still moving. Dumont swung left, and Unser's car hit him from behind, shoving Dumont into the flaming cars of Sachs and McDonald. Unser slammed into the rear of Dumont's car, pushing into the pyre, and then through the flames. Dumont bounced off the inside wall, clipped the rear of Unser's passing car, and slammed back tight against the wall. His car went rolling backwards towards the pit entrance. Holy crap, man. This is just a chain reaction of misery. Dumont got free of the crash only to see his car on fire. And his car was running on a fuel blend like the other offies, so the flames were almost invisible. Oh, man. Dumont managed to get free of his car. He jumped over the short inside track wall and started rolling in the grass, trying to uh, put out the flames on his uniform. The safety patrol managed to get to him and sprayed him with an entire fire extinguisher and pulled him further from his now fully engulfed car. Unser thought he was free of the crash, but Dumont's car had hit him on the left rear suspension and turned his car back into Rutherford's. Rutherford's car was covered in pools of gasoline, and as he tried to pick up speed and get away from the crash, Unser's car slammed into his. Rutherford's car was airborne, going up and over the nose of Unser's car and back into the outside wall, but he finally managed to get into first gear and pull away after all that. Wow. That, that's amazing. Just to have the wherewithal to like stay in it and stay like, you know, not be phased for sure. It's crazy. Insane, dude. But now Unser was trailing wreckage and his car was all torn up and missing a wheel. Unser's car rolled across the track towards the entrance to pit road. Unser climbed out of the car and managed to walk towards the pit. He was amazingly mostly uninjured, but had suffered just a few, a few burns on his neck. Rutherford's fuel tank mounted underneath the tail of his car had been hit in the collision and was ruptured and he was losing fuel. He drove his car past the pit lane that was clogged with people, so he kept on driving up the track. He wanted to keep moving so the flames on his car would either blow out or burn out. Very smart. At the flag stand, the race was ordered to stop. Only twice at Indy had a race been stopped, in 1926 and 1950 because of rain. Most drivers on the track had already stopped to avoid the flames. It was devastating, and everyone watching couldn't believe what they had just seen. The Indy 500 had stopped. Many drivers were injured, but Eddie Sachs and Dave McDonald had both lost their lives. Sachs died in his car, and McDonald died at the hospital the next day. It was a huge loss for racing. Two drivers who couldn't have been more different. The race eventually started back up, and even though many of the racers were shaken up, every single one of them returned to their car to finish the race with A.J. Foyt winning in the end, but it was a hollow victory. This was the year that Indy had stopped, and people wouldn't forget that anytime soon. In the few weeks after the race, there was a lot of blame thrown around. A.J. Foyt blamed the gasoline in the mid engine car. Many others placed the blame solely on Thompson and his reckless, not thought-through car designs. In the press, there were calls to end the 500. The Chicago Tribune printed an editorial calling to end the Indy 500. A local CBS news anchor called for the end of the race. And the Washington Post sports editor said, There is a new revulsion towards the speed carnival. The deaths and injuries will be listed as accidental, but the trappings for accident are built into the whole senseless spectacle. The negative press was plentiful, much of it aimed at Mickey Thompson. Car and Driver magazine said, Hopefully we have seen the last of Mickey Thompson at Indianapolis. To combat all the backlash and bad press, the USAC had a hearing where many people pointed fingers at Mickey Thompson. But after the dust settled and the blame was thrown in every direction, it was clear racing was too popular of a sport. The fans loved the Indy 500 and it wasn't going anywhere. But after 1964, the USAC did put in some more rules and regulations. It now required all fuel tanks to be made of metal with rubber bladder inserts and with minimum thickness requirements. No fuel tanks could be placed in front of a driver. Pressurized refueling was also banned. For the first time, a minimum vehicle weight of 1,250 pounds was set, and there were now required pit stops. And in 1965, the Indy 500 was back, with fans lining up to watch the race and drivers putting it all on the line to win. But the tragedy of 1964 wasn't for nothing. With all the innovation, there needed to be new regulations. And this blend of new technology now combined with new safety regulations cleared the way for another golden age of racing. Not only that, 
but for all his arguably dangerous and half-baked designs, Mickey Thompson may have had the last laugh. By 1967, every single car in the Indianapolis 500 was mid-engine. Our source for this episode is a book called Black Noon, if you'd like to learn more. Uh, it's all about this huge tragedy. Um, yeah, man. I mean, to this day, like, you know, indie cars remain uh, mid-engined and safety innovations are, are still going on with the the inclusion of the aero screen for, uh, I believe it was last season was the first season maybe, or the season before that. Very recent, essentially like a, a windscreen, you know, and a, and a sort of halo design that keeps cars from coming in... Uh, uh, it keeps large objects from entering the cockpit and, and uh, you know, injuring drivers. And there was this I think it huge, looks bad. It looks great. Um, there was actually I mean, a big crash at the latest IndyCar. I can't uh, I think it was at Texas where the halo definitely uh, saved a lot of drivers from injury. So, you know, yeah. people might complain about safety getting more stringent in racing. And you know who doesn't complain about it? Drivers. Yeah, drivers don't yeah. complain about it. Um, if you're watching racing for the the crashes and the destruction i think you're kind of in it for the wrong reasons um because yeah nobody wants to see a crash so yeah safety is good <laughs> especially when uh these guys you know these guys are just like some of the coolest figures in our kind of sphere and you want to keep them safe all right well that concludes this episode of uh past gas so thank you very much for listening to past gas uh, as always, uh, follow the show if you haven't. If you like this episode, follow the show. It really does help us out. Uh, it, it, no bull really does help us out. So No cap. No cap, dude. It dead uh, helps us out <laughs> so much. <laughs> she <laughs> <laughs> Follow my boys at Joe G. Weber, at James Pumphrey. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. I take pictures sometimes. That's my new You're thing. really good, dude. You're getting so much better. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Check out Joe on Twitch. Check out oh, Nolan yeah. on OnlyFans. <laughs> uh, if you like Nolan's Instagram content and you want to see the real stuff that Instagram <laughs> won't let him post, check out Nolan J. Sykes on OnlyFans. It's pretty risky. <laughs> All right. That's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. Hey, if you want to get in contact with the show, hit us up at passgas at donutmedia.com. We have an email address now. Uh, and we'll, we'll read them. We'll read the email. <laughs> yeah, we finally arrived in 1998. <laughs> Be kind. Have a good Keep one. Keep it juiced. I love you. <laughs>